Thank you for being with us today. I'm Butch Howard, and we're at Appalachian Baptist Church in Greer, South Carolina this morning. We hope that wherever you may be today, things are well with you, and you're enjoying God's blessings and goodness and mercy. This is uh, the third week now in our new series. I hope that uh, you have found it to, to be beneficial to you. Uh, I've said third. This is actually the fourth message, I think, in this series. Uh, as we move through these studies in Daniel, and uh, the entire uh, the entire series is uh, geared around the mindset, the reality that we live in a world that is now hostile toward God and those who are following God in their lives. So, as we continue this, we're finding this to be a very very uh, practical series, considering considering where we are in time. Uh, even here in our own nation. We'll get to the scriptures just in a moment. We're going to be today in the sixth chapter of Daniel. So if you could find your way to Daniel chapter 6, we'll be there just in a moment. Continue to pray for uh, the, the nation uh, as we get closer into uh, the final quarter of this year. There are a lot of things happening on the horizon uh, and in our culture, and our government, uh, in the world that are very troubling. We're still praying fervently for the rescue efforts in Morocco after the earthquake there last week. And uh, we need to pray for those who are on the front lines of this uh, uh, retrieval. Uh, and it's basically now become a body recovery uh, situation. And uh, there's uh, very little chance of uh, anyone being found alive in the rubble there. But uh, let's continue to pray for those efforts. Uh, we have a number of people, the Southern Baptist Convention Disaster Relief, uh, people there, Samaritan's Purses there, other agencies are there, uh, and we need to pray fervently for these efforts that God will help these who are on the front lines of trying to help those who have been devastated by this major earthquake. As we, uh, as we turn our minds and hearts uh, toward our own needs, uh, we have folks who are going through cancer battles here, uh, upcoming surgeries, uh, recovering from surgeries. Uh, this is normal life for so many local churches. Uh, and as you prepare to, to gather with your church family this morning, uh, I know that there are needs in your local church as well. We pray one for another. Uh, and we hope that you'll pray for us here. We try our best when we know of needs uh, to remember those prayer needs uh, before the throne of grace. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. We want to get into this. We've got uh, we get some really good things that we want to share with you today from the scriptures that I truly believe will be helpful to us as we live a countercultural life in uh, this present generation that is moving further and further away from biblical morality, biblical values, and a biblical worldview. Father, we love you. Thank you for being our God. Thank you for drawing us out of this world. Lord, you have called us unto yourself. You have chosen us, saved us by your amazing grace, Washed away our sins in the precious blood of Jesus, your Son. We are no longer on the road to destruction and death and eternal separation from you. Because of what you have done, we now have the hope of heaven, the expectation of living with you, serving you, reigning with you forever and forever. So, Father, we thank you for every blessing of life. And now, as we open the scriptures, our prayer together with my sisters and brothers who are praying in their homes or wherever they may be listening and watching, we pray together in one accord that your heart will become more, more knowable, more graspable, more, more able to grasp uh, in, in, our, in our minds, in our hearts. So, Lord, that we can truly know you, not just about you. And, Lord, not just try to muddle along, but we can truly serve you 
with all of our mind, soul, and strength. So bless our time together, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Living courageously is something uh, Daniel personified from the beginning. Even when he was back in his homeland, Daniel was a young man who believed fervently in living a life for God. Now, I think this is, a, this is a commitment that needs to be made by all of us as early as possible in our journey. Uh, some of us do not get saved till later in life. And for others, they've been saved earlier, but it's a while into their journey before they finally get fervent and they really commit uh, to being all out for the Lord. Wherever you may be in your spiritual journey, this commitment is vital. We find that to be the key to everything that's going on now in Daniel's life and in the lives of his friends. In Daniel chapter 6, the situation arises. And we know that, uh, that situations are part of life, circumstances are part of life. And a lot of times we find ourselves uh, blindsided by these things. But cultural change leads humanity away from God. It always has. Listen, I'm a proud citizen of the United States of America. I love my country. But I understand, as a student of history, this is not just true of America. Hear me out. As a student of history, every government in the history of humanity has eventually taken the people away from God, always. Government is corrupt because it's run by humans. Humans are fallen, depraved people. Our human reasoning runs contrary to the wisdom and knowledge of God. When this conflict of, uh, of opinion, of viewpoint, uh, occurs in the culture, the culture always moves away rather than to God. So we need to understand this. Even had Daniel lived in his homeland for all of his years of his life, there would have been some conflict in the culture there. Because he is an alien, he is a Jew uh, in the land of Babylon, uh, everything about his life has changed. And he finds himself in continual confrontation. There's a conflict at every turn in his life. Now, if you are sold out to God, you are dedicated to the Lord Jesus Christ, you're going to find the same reality. Everywhere you look in the world around us, you're going to find conflict and confrontation with biblical values and with the instructions and commands and precepts and principles God has established in our lives. Culture challenged Daniel's conviction. In this chapter, Daniel had been doing the same thing every day. His manner had not changed. In fact, as we read here, it pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 princes, which should be over the whole kingdom of the Chaldeans. And over these three presidents of whom Daniel was first. Now, see, that's where the problem's going to get. Culture does not like it when Christians become prominent in the culture. It has always been this way. Because when Christians are prominent in the culture, the culture is going to be directed toward biblical principles, biblical values. Back in uh, the Clinton administration, it was commonly debated in the, in the public domain that we could not legislate uh, morality. And this is when uh, the, the gay rights movement first began to take national uh, uh, attention. And it was all about we cannot legislate morality. Actually, morality has always been legislated. Uh, the fact that there's laws against murder, there's laws against rape, there's laws against theft, there's laws against 
uh, falsifying information, uh, fraud, and all of these, these. These laws are basically laws that are legislating morality. Because of man, because humanity has fallen, we have to have these laws. It is essential that we have these laws. But when Christianity is prominent, when, when Bible-believing people are prominent in the culture, there is going to be a head-on collision at some point. And the, uh, the, the desire of the culture is always going to be away from the biblical values. Jesus explained it this way. In John chapter 3, he said, Men love darkness rather than light. And he gives a reason. Their deeds are evil. When uh, President Obama was able to convince Congress to pass laws saying that it was okay for the government to use disinformation as the tactic in their uh, national security efforts, he basically made lying by the government officials legal in America. And we have been in a downward spiral since that time when it comes to truth and factuality. It's hard now for us to even know what the truth is. So Daniel was dealing with this. These presidents, and by the way, here, Darius preferred Daniel. And those other presidents were jealous. If we had time to read the entire passage here, we find, here's what they say. Verse 5, these men said, we shall not find any occasion against this Daniel except we find it against him concerning the law of his God. So then they began to work. They began to conspire. They began to uh, plan a confrontation that Daniel could not win. When we come to the New Testament book of Acts, when we first see the New Testament church as it is born on the day of Pentecost, uh, you remember Peter and others were preaching. Thousands were being saved and baptized. It was an amazing uh, period. And immediately the religious leaders began to conspire with the Roman leadership that was overseeing everything. And they began to change laws at first there was no laws against what the Christians were doing. No laws existed. And so the culture that was moving in, in conflict and confrontation to Christianity found themselves toothless. They had no weapons. There was nothing they could do except threaten. But the laws began to change. The laws began to change. And so it is here in Daniel these men who wanted to trap Daniel, they wanted to confront him in such a way that he could not win. They began to alter the laws. They were able to convince Darius to sign a decree saying that no one could worship anyone except Darius. We see that Darius, of course, was a pagan king, and he didn't have any spirituality about him. He was not a believer. He didn't have the moral underpinnings of Daniel's and his three friends. And so he bought into this. This was, uh, this was kind of stroking his ego. It appealed to Darius, the king, to have people bow before him, to come to him only for petitions uh, he kind of liked that idea. He did not understand. He was so caught up in the vanity of it that he was easily manipulated. Listen, the men and women who serve uh, at the highest levels of our government, please hear me. These men and women who serve at the highest level of our government, they're just human beings. Many of them, and I have, I've heard this personally uh, from senators. There was a time back in the early 90s when I spent a good bit of time dealing with uh, the cultural politics and, and the effects and ramifications upon uh, Christian uh, ministries. And as I was able to meet with these dignitaries, I learned very quickly 
They're just men and women, just like us. Seldom do they actually read the legislation they're voting on themselves. They have, uh, they have a staff, and those staff people work through those processes. And a lot of times, they're confronted with a bill that the only knowledge they have of it is what they hear from their constituents. And so they vote with very shallow preparation, very limited preparation. Darius was tricked because of his shallowness. He did not read and, and follow through on the ramifications of this law, this sweeping law. And so what happened was they found a way to change the law and weaponize the legal process to trap Daniel. We're seeing this over and over and over. There are subtle changes that have been moving through. When we now get to, the government gets to call a house of worship a public place. They call it a public place because the public gathers there, but it is not a public place. It's a worship venue. Therefore, it is covered by the, the rights to express our faith, our right to worship freely. And when we call it a public place, all of a sudden now all of the ordinances, all the sanctions, all the laws that govern public places have now been imposed at the church. Well, that's only one of these tentacles where the law is being weaponized. We must be on guard. You say, well, Christians can't really do much. You're right. But the one thing we can do is what Daniel did. So follow carefully. Daniel lived for God without thought of the changes in his culture. The culture going on around Daniel. I want you to look at chapter 6, verse 10. When Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house and his windows being open in his chamber. Toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before God as he did aforetime. He didn't start this when the law was passed. He'd been doing it all the time. He had been doing it all along. Now watch. We must commit to preparing ourselves before the confrontation occurs. We are living in the time right now when God's people across America and Canada, Canada is slipping much faster than, North, than, than the United States is. North America is slipping very, very rapidly into a secular culture that is anti-Jesus Christ, anti-Bible, anti-church. The time for us to prepare for confrontation is right now. The world out there hates Jesus Christ. Jesus said to us that this would be the case. They have hated me, they're going to hate you. They persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. We must not remain naive to these realities. This is coming. And the time to prepare for the confrontation is right now. We mustn't wait. Because if we wait, we're going to find ourselves in the confrontation and we made no preparation for it at all. Daniel lived for God without thought of the changes. It didn't change anything for Daniel. When it was legal, he prayed. Well, when it was illegal, he was still praying. And notice something else here. Daniel didn't pray in secret. There are folks... I think well-intentioned folks, good-meaning folks, who will say, I'm going to go along to get along. I don't want to rock the boat. I don't want to be a pot stirrer. I do not want to cause uh, conflict. By virtue of being a follower of Jesus Christ, dear believer, you are against the culture. It can be no other way. It can be no other way. There is not another option. Light has no fellowship with darkness. 
when I declare that I am a follower of Jesus Christ, I am also just as emphatically saying I am not following the culture of my time. They're going in different directions. For me to try to coexist with the culture and Christ is insanity. Not only that, it's actually compromise. And I'm going to be disloyal to my Savior when I attempt to cozy up to the culture. We're distinctly, distinctively different. Jesus uh, made it very clear in Matthew 7. He talked about two roads. There's the broad way. There is a narrow way. They're different. There is no similarity. No similarity at all. On the broad road, there are a lot of people on that path, and they're moving in a specific direction. That path leads to hell. Jesus made that very clear. There is no misunderstanding. The broad road leads to destruction and death and hell. The narrow way, much smaller, not attractive at all, and only a few people are going in, but that is the path of righteousness. We can't be on both roads. It's impossible. I can be on, for our, us, our interstate here is uh, Interstate 85 and Interstate 26. When I get on I-85, Interstate 85, I can only go in one direction. I can't go in both directions at the same time. It is impossible. Christian, get off the fence. Make up your mind. Who you belong to? Who do you serve? Daniel lived for God without thought of the culture. He was living for Jesus before the law was passed. He was still doing so after the law was passed. Daniel lived a countercultural life. This is the life he has called every one of us to. Now, there are three things in his life that really made a difference. Purity, purpose, and prayer governed and guided Daniel's life. Daniel equipped himself before the confrontation came upon him. Chapter 1, verse 8, we read, Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself. There was that preparation. There was purity that drove that decision. He would stay pure before God. In the New Testament, it's unmistakable. It's very clear. God has called the church, those who were followers of Jesus Christ, he has called us to purity and holiness. Peter writes these words, Be ye holy, for I am holy, saith the Lord. God is holy. He has called us to holiness. Holiness means to be one of a kind, distinct. It also means to be pure, clean, morally. To be pursuers of those virtues and precepts and values that God embraces and God teaches and commands. We find also that Daniel knew the confrontation was going to come. He knew uh, everything in his life had, had brought to him a very deep conviction that the confrontation was unavoidable. You can spend your life running from it, but it's eventually going to get you. You're going to have to take a stand for Jesus Christ. There were... Twelve apostles, okay, and they followed Jesus for three-plus years. Things were just great. He would go somewhere and teach. Thousands would show up. He would perform miracles. He even raised the dead. But there came a time when they met the confrontation. When they came to arrest Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, none of the disciples were quite ready for that confrontation, and they all fled into the night, every one of them. Now, John shows up later inside the court. P 
Peter, not quite so close, shows up outside the court. Judas actually was among the 12, and he betrayed Jesus rather than stay true to him. Christian, you cannot wait until it gets worse to say, okay, I'm just going to wait and see, and then I'll choose. No, it doesn't work that way. The longer you postpone being committed to Jesus Christ, the less likely it's going to be that you will stand faithful when the confrontation comes. Daniel's heart was for God, not for this life. And we see that in this passage. He valued his commitment to God more than he valued his own life. And for Daniel, compromise was not an option. It must not be an option for us as well. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, he calls us to come out from among the world and be separate. Culture abuses power and authority to confront us. That's what they did here. They changed the laws. We can expect similar tactics. We find in other places, also right here in the book of Daniel, they used music. They used large venues, large gatherings to intimidate people into conforming and complying with the cultural values of the time. We do the same thing at concerts, sports events, entertainment centers. Same tactic. When Later on, when Nebuchadnezzar erects this statue of himself, uh, all he simply does is say, bow, and everybody bows. They listen to the music and they bow, except for three. Those three men stood out. They stood out. And by that, they brought the confrontation to themselves. Culture will abuse its own power and authority, its, its ability to persuade masses in order to confront us and cower us into conforming. Ordinances and laws got changed. In chapter 6, verse 13, we, we saw that. They came near and spake unto the king concerning the king's decree. Hast thou not signed a decree that every man that shall ask a petition of any god or man within 30 days save of thee, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? Change the law. This law now had been signed. You carried the king's seal, could not be changed. Not even the king could change his mind. Daniel stood the test. And here's what happens next. I want you to see this because this is, this is the key to it all. We must change our desires. Our desire is going to have to not to be in survival mode. Well, I, I've got to get through this trial. I, I, I've got to come out on the good end of this. His desire was to be used of God rather than win. Oh, we love winning in America, do we not? We want to win at everything we do. But sometimes God's people do not win visibly. Our faith is in God's person. Not in deliverance. Listen, Daniel knew what the decree said. He was on the inner circle of the king's palace. He knew what was going to happen. He knew about the den of lions. And he knew what would happen to him if he continued to pray. Yet he refused to change, to compromise, to cave in. His faith in God's person was greater than his desire for deliverance. Number three, his motive and our motive needs to be to exalt Christ rather than survive. I don't know how many Americans will eventually be martyred for our faith. I think if the Lord tarries his coming, that's going to happen in America. Yes, I do. Very definitely, I do. But it's not about surviving physical life. Paul said to be absent from the body to be present with the Lord. He said, I want to glorify Jesus Christ, whether by living or by dying. Our response to deliverance should be what Daniel's was, humility over arrogance. He willingly went into the den of lions. He decided to rest in the power of his God 
Daniel slept on the back of a lion that night. Got a good night's rest. He rested better than the king did. And the next morning, he didn't tell the king, I told you so. He didn't scold the king for being vain and naive. No, in humility rather than arrogance, he just testified of God's goodness. We must live courageously in this present time. We are called to serve the God who is alive. He is in control. He rules and reigns. What a privilege it is to serve him. But it will mean confrontation. Make up your mind today. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Till this time next week. God bless you.